Welcome to another Museum FAQ video. I'm Paul Orselli, President and Chief Instigator at POW, Paul Orselli Workshop on Long Island. Although my beautiful Zoom background is courtesy of the Huntington Museums in California, one of their gardens, I thought it would be a nice background Somehow it makes me think of my guest today, Leslie Bedford, oh. and maybe actually it will relate because I believe it's a Japanese garden. This all ties in this, but, uh, but before we get started with the conversation, hello, Leslie, how are you today? Okay. I'm um, uh, so I always like to have guests start out by telling us a little bit about their background because as is often the case with people associated with the museum world, their paths are often uh, interesting and circuitous and not just straight line paths. So um, maybe you could start us out by uh, telling us a little bit about your background. I'm delighted to do that. But before I do that, I wanna say something to you, which is to thank you. Because in thinking about this interview and I thought of all the people who, as you just said, were furloughed or unemployed or otherwise sitting at home trying to jump start their career again, to give them an opportunity to, to talk, even if on Zoom, with museum folk and to think about museum ideas, it's a real gift. And you should feel very good about that. Oh, thank you. It's, it's, well. been, my, it's been my pandemic project, as no, I said. No, <laughs> we all need a, we absolutely need a pandemic project. Yeah, you know, the, the, it's, it's it, and thank you, you're very kind for saying that, but, um, you know, it, it is interesting. Um, you could easily, these days, what with everything that's going on to the world, you know, but stare, as, as I often say to my family, you know, let's not, stare into the pit of despair yes. for too long because too long, right. you know that uh, there are lots of things that uh, are not right in the world or that I would like or you would like or other people would like to maybe be happening differently in the world so what are we going to do about it so yeah. right now here I am right. stuck in my house and anyway so but well, you're not stuck in your house you're actually stuck at the Huntington Garden Ooh, and, hey, at, even and to tell you the truth I think it's a Chinese garden but never mind okay okay that's good so my career like everybody else's I think is circuitous I was a teacher for a long time which is not so circuitous um but the, my first museum job was at the Boston Children's Museum when it was in Jamaica Plain and they had this little 10 mat tea room that had been a gift. And my job as an interpreter, I'm not sure what we were called, part-time educator, <laughs> was to schlep a big electric rice cooker into the tea house and sit down with kids, school groups, and teach them such esoteric arts as how to use chopsticks correctly. And I did that, uh, I did that for several months actually. And then I moved away to Ohio and I was sitting out in Ohio doing outreach on Asian studies stuff when this job description came across my desk, which was a description of the job as the head of the Japan program at the Children's Museum, which by then had moved to the waterfront and was a big deal to be the developer, curator, director, blah, blah, blah. And I wasn't going to tell this story actually, but here I am. And I said, I said to my husband, this is the perfect job. And he said, well, if it's the perfect job, you should go for it. And I said, how can I? I'm living in Columbus, Ohio. Anyway, long story short. Wow, what that. a good, what a good husband. <laughs> he is a doll. And uh, that's true. So I got the job and there I was in the dream job, which was to be the head of the program, so it was administrative, the developer of exhibitions and programs, and also curator of a rather extensive and very cool Japanese collection, which was being put into study storage. Now, I don't know what that means to folks now, but it meant that we had individually packaged each object to be red, yellow, or green. You could either you couldn't touch it, or you could look at it carefully, or you could pick it up and turn it around. Or, and people came in and examined the collection. Anyway, it was a great job at a time when Japan was becoming 
as we used to say, number one. And there was a lot of money around and a lot of interest. And I was there for 13 years. And it also gave, I was mentored by some of the most creative people in the business, like Mike Spock and Elaine Gurian and Singh Hansen and Jan, all these wonderful folks. So I was incredibly lucky. And from there, because now it was my husband's turn to take the job that was the perfect job for him, which was in New York. I went to New York and I worked at the Brooklyn Historical Society just for a couple of years because of- what a, what a good wife. <laughs> yeah, <I did. laughs> we do our I wanted to, I wanted, I wanted to make sure I, after I said he was a good right. husband that you- right. I, You've got a sense of parody here, which I really like. Anyway, Brooklyn Historical, tiny little history museum, very limited resources, really small staff, but with already with a good reputation in the field for exhibitions. And doing exhibitions was what I loved doing more than anything. But I left there and went out into consulting land with the museum group, where you and I are both faithful members, and did a big exhibit called Choosing to Participate, um, which I loved working on. And then moved over to Bank Street College and ran the Leadership and Museum Education Program for 13, I sort of move in 13 year segments, for 13 years. And you are, then, you are, as they say, a serial monogamist. <laughs> you, 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 That's exactly you, right. You, you, you stay, a, you stayed there for Boston Children's Museum. And then I'm out of town. And, right. And then right. New York and yeah, right. Bank Street. So I was at Bank Street for a long time. And while I was there, I went back and got my PhD, which um, I love doing as well, to be honest. And it, it's sort of, the whole, and I realized when I was thinking about what I was going to say was that at the end of the day, what I really see myself as is a teacher. I started as a teacher. I've taught in all sorts of settings and I love playing around with ideas, which maybe sounds more highfalutin than I am, but I just think it's so important for people in this field or any, and I used to say this to my students, you know, look for some ideas that you can, that can delight you, that you can chew on, that you can play with, that you can test out, that you can talk about with other people. Keeps your brain cells from dying, but it also makes for better work. And the, the old saw about mixing theory and practice, that's the same moi, theory and practice. So there you well, are. Well, that's, that's excellent. Well, I, I should have, I was remiss, even though I, I knew you had earned your doctorate. I could have introduced you as Dr. You could, Leslie. Doctor, you could have said I, Dr. Well, Leslie. I'll just, I'll just say Dr. <laughs> Leslie again. Um, well, there's a couple of interesting things to unpack there before we uh, launch into the rest of the conversation. One is, it is interesting how things come full circle. You sort of yeah. started teaching. I mean, you obviously at Bank Street, and, and I would argue as a person who doesn't have his doctorate, but has his MAT in education. Oh, do you? That so do I. I do, MAT in science education from Wayne State in Detroit. Go Wayne State. Um, Tartars. The, um, but I, th I would argue that um, anyone involved with transmitting ideas to people in a museum context, whether yeah. they're technically in the exhibits department or the education department or in... Uh, another uh, visitor services department, they may be at their heart, our teachers. So I, I, that's interesting. It comes full circle. Uh, yeah. and then I just want to have a quick comment and then a question that would be a good segue, I think, into our conversation. But okay. the comment is, I'm always really interested, uh, and you, of course, invoked um, one of those golden nexus, nexuses of the museum business, the Boston Children's Museum, when, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when they moved to the wharf, museum right. wharf, I guess, yeah. uh, and uh, Mike Spock and Elaine, you know, people you mentioned, Singh Hansen, Elaine Gurian, uh, Bernie Zabrowski was there, you were there. Um, it's just interesting to me because, you know, so, there's sometimes uh, you think of this notion of 
you know, think of somebody like Thomas Edison or Mar Marie Curie, you know, uh, they're a genius, Frida Kahlo, they're a genius. But I like this idea of not so much like this lone genius, like this yeah. person that lightning struck, but the idea of a genius, like the idea of this environment, like there's yeah. something going on in this place and yeah. time, you know, the Exploratorium with Frank Oppenheimer or yeah. the Harlem Renaissance uh, yeah. at the beginning of the 20th century. It's like, huh, all these, you know, it's, it's sort of, it's really not an accident. No. When you look back at it retrospectively, like all of these people or these people were attracted to this place in this time because they saw an opportunity to do work that was meaningful and innovative to them. So I just, I, you know, I, I, I would acknowledge including you, Dr. Leslie, as one of the geniuses <laughs> in that situation. But I also like this notion of seniors like the the yeah. place the environment is, me too is interesting, me so. too and i think that was the luckiest thing that happened to me professionally that i landed in this place that had that environment and those people and there are other places that have played that role over time um but i used to say to my students you know if you can possibly get a job <clears throat> someplace where you see transformative leadership and a, and a kind of community sense and, and, and a real commitment to professional development, growing your people inside as well as paying attention to those outside. You take that job, it doesn't matter what it is, because you'll learn so much from that. There's, yeah. there's, there's an important, th this is the part where we put the flashing red lights in the video because oh, yeah. I think that's important also when I think of my independent career as a, as a consultant, as a business person. You know, the, the trick, in my opinion, just to reiterate in a different way what you said, you don't want to accept just any job you want to you want to you want to try and connect with a job that you are legitimately going to be passionate about and can contribute right. to in that not just sort of right. shuffling papers around right. but anyway we, we that so i just exactly. want to mention yeah. the seniors but uh, uh, just as a segue now into the main part of our conversation it's just interesting to me as long as i've known you and you you commented on the background and said uh, actually, that's not a Japanese garden. It's probably a Chinese garden. Uh, and uh, as you elucidated your work history and things, there there is this thread of connection to Asia. Yeah. And so uh, may, maybe you could just. I'm just interested. Like I like you now well, that I think yes. about. It, I was like, duh. Well, she worked on all these Japan projects, right. and she uh, right. like, and you've been to Japan and, and a lot. That. So yeah, uh, like and, how does how does that all come about? And then that's a segue, I believe, to a story about it the is. museum in Japan. Well, what you said about circling, I think much of life is spent in a kind of spiral. And, you, and I, when I wrote my dissertation, I realized I was circling around all these ideas that had been in my head for a very long time, but the, the time given to working on a PhD allows you to sort of enlarge them. And I'm finding now at my advanced age that I'm circling back to some stuff that's been there a long time, including Japan. And last spring, um, I had a chance, Frank and I went back to Japan for the first time in years for two months. He had a sabbatical project and I went along, you know, good wife that we've already established I am. And good husband who made and sure good. wife could join him on that sabbatical <laughs> right. project. So anyway, I went back and here's a little, I'm going to lead into something. And th what I've been doing recently with my life is not museum work, but writing, I'm doing lots and lots of writing. And I just finished a project called Tokyo Madeleine. And it came from landing in Japan and getting on the bus in from the airport, which is something I had done, I don't know, 25 times. And trying to remember the, the address of the place we were staying in the city where I had stayed a gazillion times doing work for the Children's Museum great big exhibit, Teen Tokyo and stuff. 
and I can't remember the name, I can't remember the name. And then I stepped down off the bus onto the ground. And I say, Tori Zaka. It just went into my head. I thought, huh, that's interesting. And then the next day, then that kind of thing kept happening. And the thing was that these sensory experiences, whatever they were, touching the ground, hearing the sound of a crow, trying to make a flower arrangement, walking through a garden, these sensory experiences all served to bring back floods of memories that I hadn't thought about in years and years. I'd gone to Japan the first time, the first year I was married, which is 48, 49 years ago. So it'd been a long time. And so I decided I would write about that and I did. And it touched on something that I have thought about a lot with exhibits, um, it, which is so how powerful, important the somatic is, the sensory is, the body is. And, and what neuroscience has to tell us about that. And so this, this sidebar, but if I were still in the field and had the time and the mental energy, I think I'd really want to learn more about that because I think, I think it's a new frontier for us and it would be cool if people were really exploring it. But anyway, here's my story, you ready? Okay. We were in Kanazawa which is a city uh, sort of southwest on the Japan Sea. And we went to a very tiny museum called the DT Suzuki Muse Museum. It's a little, small, white, serene place with a pond in the middle of four buildings. And Suzuki was the guy in mid 20th century who taught the West about Zen Buddhism. He, he actually lived in Illinois for a long time. He married an American woman and he wrote all of these books, helping us understand this extremely foreign and hard to understand way of thinking about the world. So this is a museum dedicated to him. And there are three little buildings, little white buildings, very spare. It's so Zen, you wouldn't believe how Zen it is, right? You come around the corner and one of the little buildings is called the contemplative space. And the contemplative space looks out on this interior pond. And the pond is utterly still. And then suddenly there's a plop. And ripples go across the surface of the pond. Now, if you had graduated from Japanese middle school, which would be to say everybody in Japan, or you were a foreigner who had studied about Japan, you would right away get it. And you would know that you have just experienced physically an old haiku by Basho, which was written in the 16th century. And the haiku is old pond, frog jumps in, sound of water. And I sat there and it took me, I don't know, a few seconds and I, oh, I just got it. I, I was having this Zen moment without any words with this pond and I was completely blown away, completely blown away. And then I had this feeling of envy. I thought somebody created this where are they smart i wonder who they do you know what i mean it's sort of like this is, it's not exactly an exhibit but for me it's a uh, museum right it's a museum who, who set who set up this situation that would allow this yes. to happen who was who were the was actually based on what we just said it was probably a, a good team maybe or maybe it was who knows anyway it was perfection it would not have been, I don't think it was perfection for my husband, who probably, back then, no, it wasn't. But for me, and Brad Larson, for example, who you've had on this, who writes haiku. Yeah, he I would was have gonna, known, as yeah. immediately as soon as you said haiku, I was like, oh, Brad is going to love he, this story. He would have gotten <laughs> it right away. So I've thought about that a lot, and I, and I wrote about it, that it, um, it just helped, it, it just transported me. It, it was what Lois Silverman used to call magic in the museum, you know? And I love those moments. 
I love those moments more than anything. And everybody's got their own kind of moments. And if you didn't know Basho, it wouldn't have meant much. But I thought about you. Well, but I, you know, that's okay, interesting. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, don't, I don't know about that because oh, if, okay. I, if I was in that circumstance, and I'm very envious because I've never been to Japan, and I'd like to go to the Ghibli Museum, yes. the Ghibli Studio Museum, but leaving that yes. aside, if I, was, yeah. if I was at a place, even like this place in, in my Zoom background, and I was yeah. just sitting there and it was quiet, and I was by myself or there were some people around, and I was looking out at a still pond, and then all of a sudden, plop, for whatever reason, and then, you know, the, the stillness was broken for a moment and then the ripples spread out and I, I would still, I, I, I did not know that haiku. But you would but still it, appreciate it, it, the moment. There would be something about that, that, yes. you know, you know, like, like, yeah. like, it's funny, like Kurt, Kurt Vonnegut, I, he talked about saying to uh, one of his young relatives, they were, I don't know, they were at a picnic or something and he just stopped and he said, can there be anything better than this? And oh. he told this young relative, you know, it's important to stop sometimes yeah. and just say to, and not just for yourself, but to say to the other people to acknowledge their part of the wonderfulness of the moment. Yeah. So I, 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 I think that is an awesome moment. And you, you added an additional layer because you made a connection to yeah. your experience with that haiku. I might have thought, I might have thought, being a science kind of person, I might have started thinking about ripples or ripple tanks or the the yeah. tr you um, know yeah, how yeah. what how the energy or what have you. So that's great. Yes, I agree with you. Hmm, so I that. so I guess though. Uh, since you invoked Lois Silverman um, and magic and museums, I, I, my my question always is: so how can we foster or create or frame circumstances in museums, no matter what type of museum they are, to provide more of those magical? moments so uh, w w i mean what's uh, obviously every situation is different perhaps but what are what are maybe from your way of thinking what are some ingredients to magical moments situ you know what are well, what are <laughs> ingredients that foster those that that potential for magic to happen in museum places and spaces? Um, I don't know. I can't, have, I can't resist. I have, I wrote a book, right? There, there well, we are. We will also, <laughs> and you'll be happy to know, as they say in YouTube land, we will happily provide links and resources right. in the description below. Okay. Um, I mean, that's the, that's the killer question, right? That's the big question. And um, I, if anybody has the, the, I don't think there's a definitive answer, but the place I got to in my thinking was to think, what if I thought about an exhibition as an art form, rather than focusing so much on the learning that happens? Do you know what I mean? And so I got this idea that came from, actually it came from taking seminars at Lincoln Center Institute. They were so cool. And so um, there was one on um, opera and there was one on um, string quartets and there was, there was a whole bunch. And I was sitting in one of these seminars listening to thinking, being taught and thinking about how different inst uh, musicians have to work together. And I thought, huh, what if we thought about exhibitions this way? What if we thought about exhibitions as a, a form of art? How would that influence the choices we make? And so that's what, I, that's what I thought about. And it had to do with playing around with some of the stuff that artists do, like metaphor. Because metaphor is a really cool thing, which opens up your mind, you know. 
And opening up your mind is one of the things I think we're talking about. And that's maybe what that frog thing did. I don't know. Anything that opens it up rather than shuts it down, which the elephants have four legs and a tail thing that shuts you down. Anything that opens up your mind and your imagination like story, right? So if you tell a story, you don't just tell a story, you tell a story artfully in an exhibition, you have a better shot at having the visitor say, huh, hmm, gosh, I never thought about that. That really, I think I'm gonna burst into tears or I'm gonna go, you know what I mean? So story became one of the tools that I thought we, sh we could play with to begin to get at that. There's, there's lots of, there's a lot, actually. You might want to read the book at some point. No, no, no. Well, well, well I, I have, I actually have read the book, so I can happily commend it. But like I said, we'll, we'll provide a link and okay. if people no, want to follow up on that. Uh, but no, no, that's, that's, <laughs> Leslie, I, I invite you for the conversation. This is how it goes. So, um, I think it's, you know, I think it's interesting just to go back to the example that you gave of being in the, the Zen yeah. Museum and the Suzuki Museum and here you are in the lake and plop something causes a disturbance and you see the ripples and it's very evocative and meaningful. It, 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 it was very... It, 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 it takes you out of your immediate self, maybe. It, it, it resonated with you, literally. And so, yes. but the thing I was going to say is, uh, just because you, we were talking about how we might have both appreciated it, but for slightly different reasons, I think maybe that's, you know, I think that's also part of a good story yeah. or a good symphony or a good song. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, I was trying to think, I was thinking of a quote, which I don't think I can pull up, but. We can put it in the, we can put it in the description. This is, the, I can even post it in the video. This is awesome. <laughs> okay, well, it's a cool quote from this literary critic who says, we don't go to see Macbeth to learn about the history of Scotland. We go to learn about what it means for a man to, something like this, to lose everything he values in life. Okay, so that, that's what art can do, right? There's all sorts of aspects of that, 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 that art that compels us. And I think it's useful in museums for us to be aware of that and think about what about this is applicable to what we do. And it isn't all, of course, but, and it's one reason I think why so many of the best people in the field have come from theater. I think a parallel to this, and it, it relates to good storytelling, mm -hmm. good exhibition development, strong program development is, um, you know, I, I think there has to be on the part of the people developing whatever, the program, the, the exhibition, almost a love, you know, like I feel like I have to fall in love with this subject. Like I'm finding yeah. out new things and I'm getting so excited that right. I, I like, like now I, I am compelled to share these stories or this angle on the story with people and just like wow this is cool you know like if you show somebody hey look at the look at this video on youtube this kid's this lady swimming across the swimming pool with a glass of chocolate milk on her head i just saw this olympic swimmer do that i was like wow look at this hey look at this um <laughs> the uh but you know if you as a developer as a designer can't sort of sincerely be enthusiastic to fall in love with your project, yeah. your topic. Like, why do you expect, like, why do you Anybody expect any, any sort of reaction from people at all? You Absolutely. know, if you're, if you're right. just sleepwalking through the whole process, 
you know, yeah. Well, yeah, that's what people are going to do. It's like, oh, okay, this is well, another, this is another, this is another history exhibit. Oh, there's a bunch of like my kids once yeah. we had to leave a history exhibit. They're like, Dad, everything in this entire exhibit is old and brown, like <laughs> yellow documents, old right. pieces of Chippendale furniture. Right. Even the, you know, the portraits and the anything that was in it, you know, it was like this sort of sepia tone filter that had been placed on the world. And that's how the, the information and the story felt too. It was like, yeah, this is, you know, my kids were not having anything of it. And I was like, I'm not going to drag you through this. Let, let's go. Well, okay. So this, I mean, we could, you just opened up a whole nother topic, right? I mean, because there's the, I, I said once to somebody, how could you expect visitors to use their imaginations or have their imaginations in, engaged if you haven't used yours, which is a sort of variation on what you just said. And let's finish on a, let's finish on a positive note and a hopeful note. So how can we inject that enthusiasm, that sincere love, that shared love for topics. How can how can we how can we build build more of that or bring more of that into museum experiences? You know, there there are ways of telling stories that. Yeah. Uh, so I, I just uh, now I am putting you on the spot, and hopefully you, know, if you can give me a signal if you complete if there's complete silence, then I'll know we were. No, I ju I just think. Uh, I don't know. I mean, and I think that the answer that I got to in my career was <clears throat> that you hope you can share ideas and training and support with younger people so that they have the confidence to follow through on their, <clears throat> their gut assumptions and all of that and not be beaten down, you know. And I felt, to be honest, that in the program that we did that, um, and I, but that's, a, that's, a, that's not a quick fix. So for instance, a lot of the graduates still are in touch with each other or with the teachers that they have. But meanwhile, they're out there in museums which continue to think and then like dinosaurs. And, um, I don't know what to say. I think it's the nature of human beings. Change. Well, I, well, I, there's I, glacial I, change. I, and I, did, I did my best. Did my best to try and end on a positive note. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, well, I, I think some of the I think some of the changes that are being pushed now, which are not so much about this, but about the bigger picture, the issues of social justice and the role of the museum and the community. I think those changes, I'm hopeful, are actually going to have an impact. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think so. I think, um, you know, I, I agree that sometimes it seems that change, especially in museums, does, does move at a glacial pace, unfortunately. But I think uh, what is positive to me is looking at younger museum professionals yeah. and emerging museum professionals who basically are like, hey, you know, you've been talking about diversity for the past 40 years. Yeah. We're not gonna wait around for another 40 years. Yeah. We yeah. want something to happen now. We are gonna yeah. unionize or we're gonna, we're gonna put, oh, hey, I mean, I think that's great because um, yeah. maybe, just to, maybe, just to, maybe just to end full circle, maybe that is, the part of the museum business story that, you know, where the museum infrastructure needs to be made uncomfortable a little bit for that positive change yeah. to happen. Yeah, so. I think so. I think that's absolutely true. Well, I, uh, Leslie, I really appreciate you taking the, the time. I, I think uh, as, is often the case. The, the conversation took us in some interesting places that even we might not have expected, but again, to come full circle, I think that's very uh, indicative and evocative of the kinds of situations that we hope people encounter in their museum experiences too, yeah. things that they might not have 
completely expected when they came in. So, um, well, I, uh, again, I thank you very much. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, YouTube being YouTube, what it is, we can include uh, references and links to your, to your book and okay. some of the other things that we discussed so that if people want to find out more about some of the topics or the exhib exhibitions that we uh, mentioned, uh, we can idea. include, include okay. links, links to that. So should um, I be thinking about those? Ah, yes, that's this in a good Bank Streetian tradition. I just gave you homework. an ad, an advanced <laughs> no I, a homework if you like, but an advanced an advanced organizer so that you can frame your thoughts and and come back. Uh, All right. And listen, th thanks for having me, Paul, and truly thank you for doing this. Yeah, thanks a lot. Take care. You too. Bye bye.